Right, so Armageddon is one of those words which I'm sure we've all heard. Many people know it's something to do with a battle at the end of time, and it's in the Bible. And, and very often that's about as much as we know about it. What I'd like to do tonight is to have a look at not just this passage, but other passages which do speak about Armageddon, as we have read already. That's the only verse in the Bible which actually speaks about Armageddon, that last verse of the reading. He gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now, what we need to remember is that this is in the last book of the Bible, which is a book of sign and symbol. So there are many things in this prophecy which we cannot take literally. And the other thing that we need to remember is, as we say there, the book of Revelation tells us from God's perspective uh, what the countdown is all about. And really the verses that we've read are God's countdown to Armageddon, as we shall see. Now it did say, didn't it, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So we need to go to the Hebrew to find out what this symbol is all about. And we put on, on the screen there a table giving us... Well, the English, then the Hebrew, and it's three Hebrew words, really, Arma, Gai, and Don. And we've given the Strong's numbers in the Strong's Concordance, and we've given the meaning. A heap of sheaves, a valley, and judgment. So, when it says called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon, it really means we've got a heap of sheaves in a valley, for judgment. Now, just looking at it that way, it doesn't tell us an awful lot, does it? We need to look, compare it with other scriptures. Because elsewhere in, well, first of all, in the book of Revelation, we read these words. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap. The harvest of the earth is ripe. We know that sickles were used in olden times to cut down the grain at harvest time. So that's why the sickle is mentioned there. We're speaking about harvest time and the harvest of the earth when God is going to judge the nations according to We need the same words in the Old Testament there. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe, Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow. Their wickedness is great. This is the time when God has said, Well, enough is enough. It's time now for me to judge the world. And he likens it to harvest time. And then in verse 14 there of Joel 3, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, or as the margin tells us, threshing. So we've got now another term introduced, that of threshing. And once again, in older times, that was, that was the next process that took place at harvest time. Threshing separated the wheat from the chaff, right? that which was good from that which was refuse, basically. And all these things, that, of course, nowadays are done by combine harvesters, aren't they? But we want to just stick with this idea threshing there's another passage which speaks about it many nations are gathered against thee that's against the nation of israel and we are seeing this today before our very eyes see what the end of verse 12 says gather them as sheaves into the floor arise and thresh o daughter of zion so the nation of israel is going to be used in some way in this threshing, here we see different methods used to thresh, as we say, to separate the corn from the chaff, or the wheat from the chaff, at harvest time. There's another passage which speaks about it. I'm sure we're all familiar with Daniel chapter 2, that framework prophecy which gives a potted history, as it were, of the events from the days of 
Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who had this dream, right down to our own day. So it goes through the kingdoms of Babylon, Greece, sorry, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome, and finally the days in which we live, represented by the feet of the image. And then, of course, it's that stone which hits the image on its feet. And what does Daniel say to the king when that happened? Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. Same language again, it's harvest time language. And the wind carried them away. So the, the chaff was blown away and only, only the, the, the good grain was left in this, in this uh, analogy, in this particular dream. So we've got a number of passages in the Bible. We do speak about Armageddon using this harvest type language, but don't actually mention Armageddon. And when we consider, we're not going to look at all of them, we want to look at one or two of these. All those passages that we have on the screen at the moment speak about things which are happening today. And this is why it's so exciting in a way. We can look at these passages and we can say, we can see that happening before our very eyes. And all these passages go on to say, these events are leading to Armageddon. And not only that, they take us beyond Armageddon to the time when God's kingdom is established. So Armageddon is the time of judgment on the nations, but beyond that we've got the establishment of God's kingdom, a kingdom of peace and righteousness. So we want to stick to the passages, Revelation 16, Joel 3 and Ezekiel 37. We're going to concentrate first of all on Revelation 16 and then we'll just dip into the other two as we go along. So, We've read these verses, haven't we, in the sixth vial. As we say here, the sixth vial is a preparation time. It describes God's account of the countdown to Armageddon, because the last verse that we read was all about Armageddon. So what did we read about in that sixth vial? Four things, basically. First of all, there was a river dried up. Remember, not a literal river, and we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. It was dried up to make preparations, as, as we read in verse 12. And then in verses 13 and 14, the nations are gathered to this battle. The next thing we've got is in verse 15, a warning. A warning to the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ to be watched, to watch and be on their guard. Because the next thing is Armageddon. Right, so let's look at those three, four things one by one. Well, really three of them. The, the warning to what? I'm going to leave to the end, actually. So we want to look at numbers one, two and four, just very briefly. Um, next. Remember, this is God's time scale, as it were. And we're talking about long periods of time, actually. God has been preparing for this battle for a long while now, as we shall see. That was the first thing that we read about this angel pouring out his vial on the great river Euphrates and the water was dried up to make preparations. So what does it mean? Does it mean we have to look at the river Euphrates in the Middle East and, and wait till it dries up? Well, no, it doesn't mean that. We need to compare scripture with scripture and it's so necessary with the book of Revelation to find out what that symbol means. What does it mean, a river drying up? Well, here we've got an example the other way around really. This is in the Old Testament. Isaiah says to Israel, Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. He shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over and reach even to the neck. 
So the prophet is describing a river that's overflowed its banks. And he likens that to this nation of Assyria. It's a map of Assyria in those times. The, the, the small green, dark green patch in the middle was the Assyrian Empire uh, round about, what, 1600 BC. But it expanded and expanded and ex like the river, it overflowed its banks and it went right down into Egypt, as we can see. Uh, and all the light green area on there was, was the Assyrian Empire, um, what, round about 700 BC. Now, in, in Revelation, we've got the opposite to that. We've got a river that's drying up. Right, so what we've got to do is to look at the river and, and, and apply it to a, a nation or an empire that's gradually dried up. Now, all that we've got on the screen at the moment is the river. There's a river. We can just see the river on its own. If we superimpose on that the empire that we are considering... It is, of course, the Ottoman Turkish Empire. That map shows it at, at its height, right? The river has overflowed its banks at that stage. That was in 1580. Now, for a long while now, that empire has been... Con there's, there's two maps. The first one, map number one, is what we saw before. Map number two is that same empire in 1930 if we superimpose that on map number one it's something like that we can see the river is gradually drying up uh, uh, and what a relevant symbol this is a river doesn't dry up overnight does it and this empire didn't dry up in just a few years either it took hundreds of years for this to happen but map number two, it's not yet dried up enough. Because prophecy tells us that God's eyes are always on his chosen land, the land of Israel. And in 1930, the Ottoman Empire was still in control of God's land. This is how one Bible student put it. He was writing in 1880, right? So a similar sort of map to map number two. He says, you know that the Holy Land is part of the Turkish Empire. So long as that empire exists, the way of the coming kings is barred. Is there not therefore a manifest reason why Turkey should be dried out of the way in preparation for the manifestation of the kingdom of God? And then we've got Robert Roberts, who, who could see what was happening. The river's drying up, but it's not dried up enough yet. It's not, that's what he's saying. It's got to move out of the Middle East completely. So if we look at another map now, that's the Middle East as we see it today. The land of Israel and all the Arab nations round about it. And we say that the way has been prepared because prophecy tells us that when Jesus returns that's the situation that has to exist Israel has to be back in the land and it's got to be in the midst of its Arab neighbours many of them very hostile to it so well let's look at the rest of the verse the water was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared Remember symbols. So we're not supposed to look from kings who come from the east, literally. What's the prophecy saying? Is it that word east? It's a combination of two Greek words, Anatole and Helios. And if we look in the concordance, Anatole means a rising, a rising of the sun or the stars. It's sometimes translated east because the sun rises in the east and that's what we've got here in Revelation. That word helios simply means a ray, speaking about a ray of the sun. Now looking at it that way, if we compare it with other scriptures once again, uh, oh, that, that's how Young's literal translation 
translates that phrase, that the way of the kings who are from the rising of the sun may be made ready. Right, so let's compare it with other, other scriptures. Malachi says, Unto you that fear my name shall the sun, S-U-N, not S-O-N, the sun of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And he's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why the Turkish Empire was dried up to make preparation for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was Jesus himself who said, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun, that word helios, in the kingdom of their father. So as we go through this, these few verses in the prophecy and compare, it, compare them with other scriptures, we begin to put the message together as to what this is all about. Preparations for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to establish. So, there's the verses. What we've seen so far is verse 12. Well, that's in the past now because the way has been made ready. The nation of Israel is there. The Turkish Empire has been, been dried out of the way, as it were. We know, don't we, that verse 16 is still in the future verse 15 is that warning that will come to at the end what about the bit in the middle verses 13 and 14 that's what's happening at the moment and once again we've got lots of symbols in there some of which we, we can have time to unravel others we won't but basically what those verses are saying is there are going to be unclean spirits or teachings like frogs. And it's those teachings that gather the nations to the battle. Okay, so unclean teachings or spirits like frogs. So the next thing we say is, well, why frogs? What do the symbol of the frogs represent? And one Bible student who thought it was quite obvious he says, the truth then is obvious. In AD 96, when John was in exile in Patmos, that's when he received this prophecy, the Franks were savages. It, what he means is it wasn't a civilised nation as we know it today. They were savages in an unnamed country, but the Holy Spirit revealed to him that this people would play a conspicuous part in the affairs of the nations. And foreseen by what symbol they would represent themselves, he symbolised their nation by it and styled them frogs he informed John that under the sixth vial that's what we're looking at their influence will be remarkably apparent because it's the teachings these frog like teachings that are going to gather the nations to the battle I'm sure some of us have seen this before there we've got some banners that were used by the early kings of the Franks and we notice the frogs on those banners. They, the frog was their symbol. And it's interesting that on those banners we've got three frogs each time. There's some more examples. The one at the bottom we've got there, um, that's the shield of Clovis. That photograph was given to me by by Nigel Bernhard, which many of us know here, I'm sure. And there we see Carol's hand pointing to the frogs on that banner, on that, on that shield. And that is on display in Innsbruck. So the frogs are very, very closely linked to the nation of France. This is what the history book tells us. In a political sense, it is proper to date the age in which we live from the French Revolution. The shock carried by that revolution and the spread of its principles has produced repercussions ever since and will continue today whenever the people claim the rights of national determination and equality before the law. The history book says it would little by little spread over the whole world. And it's interesting that the... Ideas that came from the French Revolution have indeed spread over. 
they will see the palace of justice in Paris. And note what it says over those three doors. Liberty, equality, fraternity. They were the three slogans of the French Revolution. And as we say there, that motto appears on in France. There's a few examples. Public buildings in France. And each time we see those three words, liberty, equality, and fraternity because they, they were the slogans of the French Revolution. So what does that tell us? We want to see what the effects of those three teachings have on belief in God. Liberty, well it basically means liberty of man from the laws of God. We can forget the Bible, we don't need the Bible anymore. We, we know better. Equality. No authority. Authority has to go. And therefore, God has got to go as well. Right? So there is no God. Fraternity. All men to be brothers. And all barriers of race, religion and class have to be removed. And in particular, anything which causes separation, they say, is wrong. Now, these are all teachings which are in opposition to the word of God. If you want to summarise it in one word, in modern times, it's humanism, really. Because humanism is built on the teachings of the French Revolution. We don't have time to really go into that to, to, to prove We've got those verses again on the screen. And once again, concentrating on verses 13 and 14 now, these teachings, they come out of the mouth of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet. I'm afraid tonight we've only got time to look at one of those. That is the dragon. And that in effect gives us phase one of this battle of Armageddon. We ask the question, how of the frog-like teachings coming out of the mouth of the dragon. And before we can answer that question, we need to say, all right, well, who is the dragon? And let's just put the cards on the table first. What we say is, the dragon today is Russia. And you might say, well, how do you arrive at that conclusion? And let's very quickly look at that, shall we? Because down through the ages, the dragon has been different. We want to draw a timeline of the history of the dragon, starting in the days of Eden, when the serpent used teaching against God. It caused Adam and Eve to rebel against the word of God, and it did it by deceit. Now really, a dragon is a big serpent. A lot of people speaking like the serpent results in the dragon. And it's normally a nation which is, is being described. The first nation that was specifically described in the Bible as a dragon is Egypt. And that's recorded in Isaiah chapter 27. And the dragon always oppresses the people of God. And of course that's exactly what the nation of Egypt did. The next nation, as we go through the Bible, which is described as a dragon, is Babylon. And as we know, it's Nebuchadnezzar that, that took the Jews captive. They were against God's people once again. The next nation described as a dragon, and this is where we need to pair, compare two passages, one in Daniel and one in Revelation, is Rome. Right, so we... we the point we're making is the dragon is different nations at different times. And Rome occupies a very important position because it was the Romans that scattered the Jews worldwide. And that was the end of the nation. And in New Testament times, God used the apostles and their followers to promote his word. And Rome proceeded to persecute them as well. History tells us that uh, the dragon actually divided into two. 
Oh, there, there's a verse from the Psalms. The psalmist says concerning Israel, Though thou hast so broken us in the place of dragons, God has used these nations to punish his people. So we've got the Roman Empire, as we just said, divided into two, the eastern part and the western part. I'm afraid we're, we're whistling through this at 90 miles an hour, but we, we, need to, we need to do this to just try and prove the point. So, in the west, we've got, if we can put it this way, a cousin of the dragon. The Bible calls it the beast, and the dragon is in the east. If we bring that up to date, Russia eventually becomes the dragon. And let's see how we... Here's a quote from National Geographic Society. Since the Byzantine, that's the Eastern Roman Empire, had fallen in 1453, Russian churchmen had developed the idea that Russia would become the Third Rome after Constantinople and the original Rome on the River Tiber. They claimed that Ivan III was a descendant of a brother of Caesar Augustus. We're connected with Rome, they said. In fact, the very title Tsar is from the Roman Caesar. So there we've got just one quote that we could go to others to show the link between the Roman Empire and Russia. Looking at it geographically, the dragon, this is in New Testament times, was in Rome. It was in the days of Constantine that it moved east to Constantinople. And then, of course, it moved north to Moscow. And there we've got the three Romes book that we looked at gives us that map it shows us the three Romes Rome, Constantinople and Moscow it also shows the symbol that the Eastern Roman Empire used it was a double headed eagle and there it is on that photograph the inauguration of President Yeltsin back in 1996 look at the top of the picture there's that double-headed eagle once again, showing that, that yes, they are linked with the, the old Eastern Roman Empire. Right, so very quickly we, we've tried to show how Russia is the latter-day manifestation of the dragon. We asked the question, does the dragon speak with this, we call it a frog-like voice, liberty, equality, fraternity, people's rights and all this sort of thing? That's Mr. Putin's first New Year's speech in the year 2000. He said, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of the mass media, the right to private property, all these basic freedoms of a civilised society will be reliably protected by the state. And that's amazing from Mr. Putin. He said it, and the prophecy said it will come out of the mouth of the dragon. And there's another similar uh, quote uh, recorded by The Guardian just a few months afterwards. Russia is becoming a truly democratic state. And we see the hollowness of those words uh, today. But we say, how is that teaching gathering the nations to the battle of Armageddon? Well, Mr Putin is using these teachings in other ways as well. And let's look at one or two examples. That's back in 2005. At the funeral of Yasser Arafat, he said, Russia has a right to sell the Palestinians armoured personnel carriages, etc., etc. Just a few years later, BBC records here, Russia backs Iran's nuclear rights. Right, so nations have a right to develop nuclear weapons that's what he's saying there or right now we're in the Crimea and the Ukraine fierce clashes between pro and anti-Russian protesters it was at that time when Mr Obama made a 90 minute telephone conversation with um, Putin and he says you're flouting international law 
You're not, you're not using democratic procedures at all here. And what was Mr Putin's response? He responded by saying, Moscow reserves the right to protect its interests and those of Russian speakers. So we see how Mr Putin is using these teachings which emanated from the French Revolution now. We've got the right to do these things. We're, we're protecting the rights of our, our people in these different countries. That's what Here the Washington Post records for us at that time. Putin says, We have gathered here today in connection with an, an issue of vital historic significance to all of us. A referendum was held in the Crimea on March 16 in full compliance with democratic procedures and international norms. Oh, we're democratic, he says. More than 82% of the electorate took part in the vote and over 96% spoke out in favour of uniting with Russia. He says, these numbers speak for themselves, don't they? We, we, we are a democratic nation uh, and we do things democratically. Here's an interesting thing which cropped up from the front page magazine. Hamas ponders referendum to incorporate Gaza into Russia. According to pro-Hamas pro uh, Palestinian information, we read, there are 50,000 Russian women which have been imported into the Gaza as brides for the Gazans. And they are, are spearheading this idea that Gaza becomes part of Russia. We, th this is a low-level thing. This is not, this is not the, the politicians saying this, but... It's interesting. Moscow said, in response to that, it would defend its citizens no matter where they were in the world. Oh, we've got a right to do, we've got a right to protect our citizens wherever they are in the world. And when asked about the fact, well, Russia's a long way away from Gaza, they said, yeah, the Falklands and Gibraltar are a long way from Britain. So what? You know, they've got they've got answers for all these things, and I suppose that's something to watch. As we've said, that's not a high level thing at the moment, but who knows? It, it might become. German magazine here, Der Spiegel, and look at the front cover. There's Mr. Obama wagging his finger. Uh, what do you think you're doing, uh, Mr. Cameron? He doesn't know what to do. And Angela Merkel, she's got the white flag out. And what do we read inside the magazine? They say for Germany, the Ukraine crisis is not some distant problem like Syria or Iraq. It goes right to the core of the question of German identity. Where do we stand when it comes to Russia? And relatedly, who are we as Germans? With the threat of a new east-west conflict, this question has regained prominence in Germany and may ultimately force us to reposition ourselves. This is interesting in the light of Bible prophecy, is it not? We've got this business of gas and oil. Financial Times, they say, Europe's dangerous addiction to Russian gas needs a radical cure. And the map shows us the percentage of gas used by these different countries and how much of it comes from, from Russia. You see... Mr. Putin has got himself into a very powerful position and is using gas now as Daily Telegraph, April this year. Mr. Putin threatened the extreme measure last week of cutting off Russian gas for Ukraine unless the country pays in advance for its supplies. And just the week before that, why he doubled the price of gas to Ukraine, knowing that they couldn't really afford to pay that and so the tap has been turned off as far as Ukraine is concerned not too much of a problem at the moment but they do have reserves and we're still at the end of summer but what happens when the winter comes uh, things are going to get very tough then we read on in the telegraph in a stark letter to 18 world leaders Mr Putin acknowledged that in such a critical situation, gas delivery to the European Union would also be jeopardised. 
So there's a threat to Europe as well. You know, if, if you don't play ball with us, that's what might happen. And so as we know, Russia has taken over the Crimea, as it were. And we say, why is it so important to Russia? And part of it relates to that place there, Sevastopol, a naval base that Russia has at Sevastopol. It's been there for a long, long while. But the, the lease was about to run out and Ukraine could have taken it back. But they made an agreement with Russia. We'll extend the lease to 2042 if you give us cheap gas, they said. And what's happened? Why well, Russia's taken the base anyway and also put the price of gas up and that's the country that the nation there's another naval base of Russia that's in the Mediterranean it's the port of Tartus off the Syrian if we put these ideas together what have we got we've got a port of Tartus where the Russian uh, navy are stationed now we've got one in Sevastopol as well. We read here that the Russian Navy intends to build its presence up in the Mediterranean Sea, particularly in the area close to Syrian shores. Up to 10 battleships are going to be stationed there. We can see what's taking place coming up. Preparations are being made here for something significant. Let's have a quick look at Ezekiel 37, and, and we don't really have time to uh, explain all this. Uh, but for those of us who are familiar with Ezekiel 37, we know that we've got two groups of nations which are mentioned here. One headed by Russia, and another one by, what, the English-speaking nations. But we read there in Ezekiel 38, and at verse 7, Speaking to the Russian side, Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled, and make preparations, the prophecy is saying, to the Russians and its allies. And that's exactly what's happening at the We read here that since taking 51 vessels from Ukraine without resistance, Russia has more warships than America. For the first time in its history, Russia, the Russian Navy, is the biggest in the world. And there are now many more uh, vessels, active vessels, than do the US. Joel chapter 3. We won't turn to it, but it just says, Proclaim this among the nations, prepare war. And we see them doing that. And Mr. Putin is using this language of the frogs, if we can put it that way, to make the preparations. They've got to... Here's an amazing thing. The biggest hovercraft in the world. We see it capable of 100 kilometres an hour on sea or land. Just keeps going. Sea or land. Transports 500 soldiers... And it has a payload of 300 tonnes. There's another photograph of it on the land. And we can see from those figures what, what an amazingly big vessel this is. Russia's been building these for 20 years. Prepare war, the prophecy says. And that's exactly what's happening. We say to ourselves, does Russia need all these things to protect its own borders it's obviously interested in something bigger than here we see a Russian warship in the Bosphorus and once again there are dozens and dozens of these in, in the Russian Navy they have a payload of 450 tonnes and they've got doors at both ends that can open up to, to let the tanks roll out onto the land so we see Russia building up its military presence. That's how the New Statesman looked at this um, a few months ago. 
the Russian bear coming down and, and there's Mr. Obama and, and Mr. Cameron with their flags, the Stars and Stripes and the Union Jack. We know from prophecy that Angela Merkel shouldn't be down there with them, but that's another story. We, we've reached the stage, haven't we, where even the newspapers and magazines can see what's happening. They say the mood in Moscow is turning nasty. And they can see that war is just around the corner one way or another Ezekiel 38 speaks about those two nations and others with them they will oppose Russia at the time of the end what did John Thomas write back in 1848 he said when Russia makes its grand move for the building up of his image empire then let the reader know that the end of all things as at present constituted is at hand. Well, we've reached that stage now, haven't we? We see Russia building up its image empire, as he puts it. And so we know that the end of all things as at present constituted is at hand. The battle of Armageddon is just... And so we, we ask the question now, Will the world ever know peace? And here's another take on this on this humanist aspect. Here we've got a religious humanist speaking. He says, faith in action. It says, humanism teaches us that it is immoral to wait for God to act for us. We must act to stop the wars and crimes and the brutality of this and future ages. Or we can do it. And that is another aspect of humanism. Don't worry, we'll solve the problems, they say. Just give us time and we can do that. He says, we have powers of a remarkable kind. We have a high degree of freedom in choosing what we will do. Humanism tells us that whatever our philosophy of the universe may be, ultimately the responsibility for the kind of world in which we live rests with us. And how wrong that is. Let's dip into Ezekiel 38, shall we? And see what God has to say about that. Ezekiel chapter 38, and at verse 18, we read there, It shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. That's when God says, enough is enough. His fury comes up in his face when these nations come against the land of Israel. He says, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken, surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep on the earth and all men that are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. And we know other prophecies which they speak about this great earthquake that will take place when Jesus returns to the earth. See what it says at the end of this chapter. Verse 23. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord so forget what the humanists say that's what God tells us his fury will come up in his face and his judgments will indeed be seen on this earth in a scale that we never witnessed before Isaiah said this he says, with my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me I will seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. He says, it's no use showing favour to the wicked, Isaiah says. He won't learn to do the right things. It's the judgments of God that need to be seen in the earth before the earth can see, see peace. And that's what we're saying. The prophecies speak about Armageddon, the judgment, 
and beyond. The work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. And so that's what the Bible tells us it will be like beyond Armageddon. How can we survive the horrors of Armageddon? Because they are indeed going to be drastic. God's judgments on the nations. Remember that verse in Revelation 16? Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments. Here it is again. Jesus says in Luke 21, Watch ye therefore... And pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. You see, it's not God's will that anyone perishes, but he won't sit by forever and let wicked men rule the world. He offers to each one of us a way out. There it is. And of course, that's what the Bible is all about. Be ye therefore ready. We need to prepare. You see, God has been preparing for this battle for hundreds of years now. He, he's, he's got the nation of Israel in position. He, he's pushed the Turks out of the way. And we can see Russia preparing for war. All as, exactly as the, as the prophecies say. And he invites each one of us to escape all these things if only we will listen to his word and try to obey it to the best of our ability we need to prepare ourselves God is preparing the nations are preparing the question is are we preparing for that great day are we carefully and prayerfully reading the word of God and putting it to practice in our lives so that when Jesus does return we might be with him to share the glories of the coming age we read here now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our saviour be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and ever Amen. Oh,